Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. And I'm Slim Shady. The real Slim Shady. <laughs> I don't have Damn any straight. idea. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with my niece, Gianna. And Godchild. And Godchild, excuse me, Gianna. And Gianna is my cousin. Hey, G. Hi. <laughs> well, no relation here, but hello, Gianna. Thanks for taking the time out to speak with us today. No problem. Gianna is going to talk to us today about appendix, which is a little tiny thing in your Worm -like. gut. It's like a sliver of like yeah. a outgrowth or something. And the appendix no. okay. can become cancerous. And we are going to talk about appendix precancer. Um, I've heard of appendicitis. Yes. So but, it originally started as that. Okay, but appendix precancer? What's that? Yes. So I went in. I was actually sick. I was sick. This was when I was 23. I was sick for a couple months, and I thought it was the flu. Oh. Being a sure. hairstylist, I'm always with kids and cutting their hair all day. They're coughing all over me. It was February. Okay. So I kept thinking I would get the flu. Or it was right. the winter, I should say. This was right. a couple right. months before that. Um, so... I went to the doctor and they said, okay, you self-diagnosed, you got the flu, take a few days off, you know, just soup, fluids, get better. So did that. And about a month later, I ended up sick again. And when I say sick, the symptoms were to the point where like, I would feel like I would have to have a bowel movement and okay. I couldn't. Okay. And it was so uncomfortable that yeah. I would almost want to make myself throw up because then I would have anxiety yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, and also probably pressure. Yeah. Yes. So... I couldn't throw up or have a bowel oh. movement. So it was more like just poison, I felt, like just stuck in there. Okay. So it became to the point where, I know this is kind of, I shouldn't say this, but I have to. I would smoke marijuana to- Oh, you could say that. Yeah, to make it better. Okay. Um, yeah. That was the only way that I could feel okay. Okay. I would have to do it. Right. right. Um, so, and it wouldn't make me like, high as in like stoned it would make my body feel better right. like it just took that pain away for well, whatever. Well you realize that we've done several episodes on medical marijuana yes. so we totally understand that. Yes yeah. anytime you're ready to legalize it JB we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I would do that and then I, I told my doctor that um, I started getting these intense hot flashes and I was doing my mom's hair at home one night and I actually buckled over in pain and she's like is that really how you're feeling yeah. or are you just being dramatic <laughs> and I'm like no like I th like it's bad like it was a major hot flash um so she goes I gotta bring you to the hospital and I'm like mom like it's probably just the flu can come cut like it came back like I'll go to the doctor tomorrow so I went to the doctor and uh, he, you know, he checked me and he's like, if your stomach doesn't feel better, he gave me antacids. Oh. He's like, if this doesn't feel better, then we'll have to admit you and we'll have to give you a CAT scan mm -hmm. of your stomach. Mm -hmm. So I had the antacids mm -hmm. and uh, I went to work that day and I was working the night shift of one to nine and around seven when I finished the client I was working on. I had to go in the back and I buckled over in pain. So I almost fainted. Like I remember like holding onto a chair. Mm -hmm. So I told my work staff like I had to leave. Um, I called my mom and I told her like, we have to go to the hospital. I drove myself home. Oh. <laughs> um, From Oak Park to Chicago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> only a 10 minute drive, it wasn't okay. too bad. Um, my mom was waiting for me in the car with ready to go. So I jumped out of my car, jumped in her car and went to the hospital. Okay. Um, at this point, I couldn't stop throwing up. So Jeez. I was in the emergency room, but not called yet in the bathroom of the, of the waiting area throwing up. So my mom finally came and knocked and they're like, they're ready for you. And at this point, I'm really nervous because I've never had a sickness that took over me like that where I didn't know what was wrong mm -hmm. so that that was scary in general so they asked me you know what you know what's going on and I said you know now I can't stop vomiting this pain has been you know in my stomach for a while probably two months two mm -hmm. three months you know I I don't know what to do so and I told them I'm like I smoke the marijuana to make it go away but that only lasts so long and it always comes back so I don't want to keep masking it mm -hmm. either right 
Um, so, and they, they were totally fine with that, by the way. Mm -hmm. And they just said, okay, we're going to have you drink this whatever they gave me to calm my stomach down because at this point I was just dry heaving. Like mm -hmm. I could not like get a hold of it. And I'm shaking now too. So I'm like, I told the nurse, I was like, I can drink that, but I'm probably going to throw it back oh, yeah. up. Right, right. And I, sure. and I totally sure. did. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally did. So um, then they gave me Ativan. They gave me a drip mm -hmm. to calm mm -hmm. me down because I was just crazy. And then um, I did calm down because I, I, my blood pressure was probably really oh, high yeah, just that. from just being nervous. So that calmed me down, that Ativan drip. And I felt like instantly better. Plus, they probably gave you uh, something like Zofran they to probably calm gave your me, stomach. Yeah, they right. probably gave me a, whatever was in that drip. I right. just remember being like, ah, like better. that feels right. way better. Right. They gave me the CAT scan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And within, I mean, I was laying down. My mom was with me the whole time. They said my appendix was actually three sizes too big. Ooh. And they said it's appendicitis. We'll just have to remove it. Right. And I just thought appendicitis, I know that from, uh, what's that movie? The French little girl with the know. maid who has appendicitis. Not, Mat not Matilda. I don't know. Madeline. Madeline. Oh, Madeline oh. had it. So I yeah. thought of that and I said, oh, it's totally going to be fine. Madeline yeah. had yeah. it. She was sure. just on best red for, best bed rest for a little. <laughs> so they did emergency surgery. Well, they did a 7 a.m. surgery first thing in the morning. So I, I slept there, woke up, had the surgery, and then everything everything was fine. I mm -hmm. was in recovery. I was recovering really well. They went in laparoscopic. So I didn't have, you know, I had the glue. I didn't have any stitching or anything like that. And I was just recovering on, you know, the patient meds that they gave me at home thinking nothing of any of anything appendicitis done taken out good right. Right. so I went to my next doctor's appointment um, a week later so they could check my incisions and mm -hmm. see if everything mm -hmm. was healing correctly yeah, right. and he and my mom didn't come with me because she just figured it was just like a result of you know oh hey looks good go yep. ahead yep. right well he sat me down and he actually the doctor uh, gave me a diagram of what he saw how big my appendix was and there was a growth attached to it. So he said, it looked so weird, and I've never seen it before, that I had to do a biopsy mm -hmm. on this section of your appendix. Right. And it turned out, I mean, there's just so such a long word for it, and mm -hmm. I don't remember what it was, but um, it turned out to be a liquid-filled tumor mm -hmm. in there that had the precancer in there as a fluid. Right. So what he was telling me was he wanted me to go to the oncology department mm -hmm. and then get checked also at Rush because he was very careful, but at the same time, if they would have made a cut on it or it ripped in any way when they were taking it out and any of that fluid were to go into my body and spread, that would have been a very hard thing to get a liquid precancerous fluid out of the body. Right. Sure. So they wanted me to go for routine checks every year for a couple years. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I went for two years. I think I went every six months for the first year and then one year after that and then I was pretty much done. Okay. Um, and everything turned out fine, mm -hmm. obviously, which is right. great. But that was pretty. That was pretty crazy to go then to an oncology yeah. department. Of course. And then the oncologist said, "Okay, we're gonna send you to Rush." Which all these students come in the room and start poking at me because oh, no. they. This is like one in every five hundred thousand people get this random precancer appendix. Right. You know, and they wanted to make sure that these little liquid tumors weren't growing. You know, elsewhere. Right. right. So that was pretty much my story. So it all worked out. But yeah, that was pretty scary. Definitely for a while. Right. Well, did you know that there are six types of precancerous appendix? I did not know that. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> the uh, the basics of each type, okay? There won't be a test, so you don't have to, uh, <laughs> to memorize them. But number one is a neuroendocrine tumor, which we've talked about neuroendocrine tumors before on different podcast episodes, mm -hmm. also called a carcinoid tumor. And 50% of appendix tumors are neuroendocrine tumors, and they start in the hormone-producing cells. It usually doesn't spread or metastasize, and they are found usually in patients 38 to 48 years old. Well, you're not that old, so... 
Right. No, but you know what? I'm looking at your number two, and that sounds a lot like what it was. And they said this is, you know, found in 60 year olds. Maybe I just had a fluke, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes. Well, then number two is the meniscus. Oh, mucinous. Mucin. Mucinous? Mucin. 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 Mucinous. 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 Adenocarcinoma. Yeah, we haven't fun here Mucinous yet. Mucinous adenocarcinoma, also called an MAA. And these are swellings or sacs filled with mucus, just like you were describing, on the appendix wall, just like you were describing. It was yep. off to the side. And these can also be benign, like yours, or precancerous. Oh, I guess that was like yours. Yep, yeah. And um, the typical age for patients with this um, is about 60 years old. Now, but you know what? Maybe, You've already always had an old soul. Yes. Yeah, I did. Yes. It's, it's you, true. Yes. Very true. Yep. Uh, Ron, why don't you tell us what number three would be? Why, certainly. Thank you. The third one we're talking about is colonic type adrenocarcinoma. These account for about 10% and are usually found at the base of the appendix. They're always cancerous, which you might have been able to tell by the name. They act just like the most common type of colon cancer. And these are more often found in men than women and usually appear in people again in their 60s or old souls like Gianna. They often go unnoticed and if a person has appendicitis and the appendix is removed, the cancer will then be removed along with the appendix. Ron, do you want to tell us about number four? I most certainly will. Number four is signet ring cell adrenocarcinoma. Yes, by the name, you can tell that these are also cancerous. Cancerous. This form is considered to be more aggressive and more difficult to treat than any other types of adrenocarcinomas. The name comes from how it looks under a microscope. Lita, you want to do number five? Yes, I was just thinking about that. Goblet cell carcinomas, also called GCA, uh, they have features of both the adenocarcinomas and neuroendocrine tumors, and they're rare. Less than 20% of appendix cancers are GCA types, and the typical age that they're found is in the early 50s. They are more aggressive than neuroendocrine tumors. Treatment is often similar to treatment for adenocarcinomas. We can talk about treatment later. And lastly, number six, paraganglia... Ganglioma. Ganglioma, thank you. These are rare tumors that grow in nerve cells of the peripheral nervous system, nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. And these are usually benign, but there are, or there was one rare case of a malignant paragangliomas. Thank you. In the appendix in scientific literature. Only one. Only one. And Gianna, did you know that on this block right now, there are two individuals who had similar situations? Really? Two yes. doors on down. On this block. Two That's doors crazy. down from us is a woman who had her appendix removed, and it, it was um, precancerous as well. Right. Really? Right. And um, so, Gigi, you told us about the signs and symptoms you first had and how important it is to go in. And did anything else help with that discomfort or pain? Just the marijuana. All righty. <laughs> okay, and, then. <laughs> there okay. we go. And when your appendix was taken out, did you get to keep it? I did not get to keep it, no. Um, they just drew that diagram for me, and that's pretty much all I, all I saw of it. Did you get to fly back and forth to Greece and decide to fly home to have surgery instead of having it in a foreign country, risking life, limb, and scaring the bejesus out of your two daughters? <laughs> I think that was my godmother. <laughs> I think you are right. It was my yeah, mother. it might have been. Okay, we'll do that uh, in another episode. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted to take my appendix out on the plane. Yeah, I think they should have taken your appendix out when you were still on Crete. Okay. She sounded like Minnie Mouse and uh, could not move. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's definitely painful. Yes. Well, we know how, uh, how long it took your healthcare team to, uh, to treat your appendix. So what was the recovery time like afterwards? Um, I mean, I recovered pretty fast. I actually told my boss that I would be back on Monday and my surgery Whoa. was on like Wednesday. Whoa. And she told me I was absolutely crazy and that <laughs> I better talk to my doctor first. And I went in and he gave me a month off. I don't know if I needed that much time, but he did give me that much time, so I took it. You probably you probably said, well, Matilda went back, right, the next yeah. day. Yeah, and, and <laughs> this one needs to be a Matilda 2.0. Yes, <laughs> Madeline. Madeline. Oh, Madeline, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Jeez. Yeah, but you like Matilda, too. Yeah, what I do. Favorite, yes, what are your I love, I love both. I yeah. love both. And um, has being appendix-free affected your everyday life? Are you able to work? Are your recreational activities about the same? And, you know, how are your leisure uh, pursuits and things of that nature? Yes. So, I mean, I've always been, like, 
semi-active in the exercise field. This actually pushed me into full exercise. I feel like I had major anxiety after the surgery every time I felt like I have to have, had to have a bowel movement or if I were to get sick, which was, that's very rare, but mostly just the bowel movements, yeah. I would get really worked up and start to think that there was another tumor growing in there. So that took me probably, I would say a couple I don't know, maybe a full year to get over. Oh, geez. Well, we're yeah. going to be doing an episode on colorectal cancer next. Stick around. It's interesting. Yes, sounds good. <laughs> well, according to the Appendix Cancer Research Foundation, there is no known cause for appendix cancer, and it only occurs in 10 people per million wow. per year. Wow. So that's a very small amount. They also state that unless it's caught very early it can spread to the peritoneal and abdominal cavity Just like you were which saying, is what you right, were worried yeah. if they cut it right. right right exactly and those cases are even more rare with only about a thousand in the world every year so i guess it's a good thing that appendix pain is harsh enough to get people's attention yeah and if you ever have like a feeling i mean now of course i got used to the feeling of just not having anxiety you have to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. um but if you do have a feeling and it lasts more than a couple of days in your stomach i think that you should go as well yeah. because who knows if i would have waited and that would have ruptured then i would have i would have been in a way different situation today true so with that you know with that being said just i always tell people if you have a stomach issue just go okay well, what about the laparoscopic surgery? I wonder if using that, if any of them are missed. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, actually, I do know the answer to that one. Okay. So um, the appendix, like any tissue taken from the body during surgery, is going to have microscopic study. Um, is that biopsy pretty yes, much? Yes, right, yeah. right. Done during the pathology. Mm -hmm. So the pathology report tells the doctors the type of cells and how they're arranged, whether the cells are abnormal, and of course, if there are any precancerous cells. Okay. So if there are precancerous cells, the surgical site would uh, be open more fully to allow a thorough examination of the area surrounding the appendix to include the abdominal wall and the colon. Oh, all right. Well, she's been studying for the interview. She yes. does. <laughs> Good information. Um, yes. No. Yeah. No problem. I'm glad to t glad to help. Definitely. Um, <laughs> anyone that needs help. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you um, for sharing your story with us, Gianna. And we might need help with gardening this year. I mean, okay. Anyway, do you have any additional advice for our listeners? Nope. Just to listen to your body always. Um, good advice. And yeah, yeah I mean, advice. that's that's the best advice. I mean, I even I even tell that to my gym members if they're feeling a little too sore to do the workout. Listen to your body. You don't want an injury. <laughs> good, Great. good. Thank you, Gianna. No problem. Well, I do think that our listeners will be very inspired by your story. Absolutely. True. If any of our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you listen to this podcast. And as always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard in this podcast. Till next week. Bye, guys. Bye.